This happened to me a couple of months ago. One night I was working the night shift at Burger King. I'm talking 3 a.m. in the morning. We don't really get that many customers at this time of night, maybe the occasional 5 to 10 at most. I personally liked working the night shift because it usually was not that busy, and because I would kill most of my time watching YouTube videos on my phone. A couple hours pass and I hear someone at the drive through menu outside. It sounded like a man making an uneasy groaning sound. I said my usual, Hi, may I take your order? I then heard the man say, One Big Mac, please. I couldn't tell if he was being a smartass, but I ended up telling the guy this isn't McDonald's. I heard him chuckling after I said that. I honestly thought it was some drunk guy from the club causing trouble. I checked the camera only to see a man standing outside next to the drive through menu. He looked like a pale middle-aged man wearing a white t-shirt and a pair of jeans, and he wasn't in a car. He was just standing there looking at the drive through menu. Our policy for the drive through is that you must be in a vehicle in order to purchase something. The man then said, I guess I'll take a Baconator instead, and chuckled again. I now knew that this guy was a psycho trying to find amusement for his personal pleasure. I said, Sorry, but you can't order anything without a vehicle. There was a pause of silence, with no response. I then checked the camera, only to see the man was no longer there. I opened the window and I looked outside at the parking lot, only to see nothing. I disregarded what had just happened, and I continued watching videos on my phone. A couple hours later, I hear someone at the drive through menu again. I checked the camera only to see the same man from earlier. He said, Tell John I said hi. This gave me chills because John was my manager's name. I asked him who he was. He then said, It's Dave. Once again, I popped my head outside the window only to see nothing. I checked the camera again to see the man was no longer there. I was a bit disturbed to say the least, but I waited for my manager to clock in. Later on, my manager arrives at work and I tell him that a man named Dave said hi. My manager had a look of confusion in his eyes and he asked me what the hell I was talking about. I then explained what Dave looked like and the encounter I had had with him. He then tells me that Dave used to be an employee that worked at Burger King. Until he died. He tells me that he died in a car accident one year ago, and then he showed me a picture of Dave. The picture was identical to the guy I saw that night. I tell my manager, this can't be true. I literally just talked to him. I decided to show my manager the camera footage, and this is what it looked like. This happened to me and my cousin a few years back. I was babysitting for my aunt and I had just put my cousin to sleep. I turned around and began walking down the hall into the living room. I had just sat down when I heard my cousin screaming. I stood up and walked into the room where she was sleeping. I saw her crying. I asked her why she was crying. She said a word that sounded like boogeyman. There's no boogeyman, I said. Just go to sleep. I left and 20 minutes later this happened again. I went into the room and she was still crying. Then I heard the crash coming from inside the closet. My aunt's closet door began rattling. It was a big walk-in closet with a door and everything. The handle began turning back and forth and the door finally opened a crack. I picked up my cousin and we ran into my older cousin's room. I never told my aunt what happened. Even if I wanted to tell her, I wouldn't even know where to begin. A couple of years ago, I had my first and so far only experience with the supernatural. For a little background, I live next to a canal, and at night I get light from streetlights reflected up through my window in that moving, watery way. I'm also a fairly heavy sleeper and hardly ever wake up in the middle of the night. It was a Thursday night, no different from any other. 
I was in bed asleep as usual when, guess what, I woke up. The way my bedroom was laid out, I had a digital clock facing me, so I know it was 2.36 a.m. I'm sure you know that in this kind of situation, you realize that it's the middle of the night, and take great pleasure in going back to sleep. I, however, felt odd. I cannot explain it any better than that. I simply felt odd. I was laying on my left side facing away from my door. As I laid there awake and a little confused as to what I was feeling, for no reason at all, I looked over my right shoulder in the direction of the corner of my bed and doorway, and there standing silently was what I can only describe as a monk. He was wearing the long robes with the cowl covering his bowed head. I was initially startled, as you'd expect, but then I felt safe. I was not afraid. I had no desire to run because it did not feel at all threatening. It was solid, not misty or transparent, and I could see the way the reflected light feels on the contours of his robe. Then it was gone. No fading, just there one second, gone the next. I rolled over and fell seemingly instantly back to sleep. I have always believed in the supernatural and spirit guides, and as I am not religious, the closest thing to praying I ever do is to speak to my spirit guide if I am worried or stressed. It sounds funny, but speaking a problem out loud, even to what might just be an empty room, can be helpful in putting it into perspective. Could it be this acceptance and acknowledgement of my guide that allowed me this glimpse at this being who is working to help me in some way? I'm 13 now, so this happened five years ago when I was eight. It was Halloween, and every year we'd go to my grandparents' house. My uncle, who was 14, was taking me and some of my cousins trick-or-treating. It was dark, but there were some people outside waiting on the fireworks show. We trick-or-treated here every year, so we know the neighborhood. Everything was going normal, but I was older this year, and we wanted more candy, so we decided to go to another neighborhood we never went to before. We went through the first couple of houses, and we were all joking around. My uncle was chasing us, and I fell. My knee started bleeding. I thought there was a lot of blood, but I was eight, so I was probably being dramatic. So I went to go back to my grandparents' house to get a band-aid. My uncle was going to take everyone back with me, but I told him it wasn't that far. I can just go back. And I was the oldest cousin there, so I didn't want to be treated like a baby. When I turned around the corner of the street... There was a man walking alone coming towards me. He looked pretty normal, so I wasn't really scared by him. He stopped in front of me when he got close enough, so I stopped too. He asked what I was doing out alone, and seemed pretty friendly. I told him I was going back to my grandma's because I cut my knee when I was trick-or-treating. He said his house was right down the street, and he could get me fixed up in a couple of minutes, and I could go back trick-or-treating again. I thought this was a good idea because my mom and dad might not let me out again if they knew we were messing around and I got hurt. So I was stupid and decided to go with him. When we got back to his house, he got me a drink and a band-aid and I was sitting on the couch. He came and sat really close to me and I started to get scared because he was acting weird now and not talking much. He put his hand on my leg and started moving it around. I just jumped up and went to run out, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me back hard. I started crying and telling him to let go, but he just started acting friendly again and asking me why I'd want to leave already. I didn't know what to do and sort of just froze now and just stayed there because there was nothing else I could really do. Time passed and I guess I was there longer than I thought, because I heard my uncle shouting my name from the streets, so he must have gone back to my grandparents' house and realized I wasn't there. The windows were open, so it was pretty loud. I jumped up again, and the man saw my reaction and realized it was someone looking for me. I ran out the door this time, and he just let me go. I told my uncle, and we both ran back to my grandparents, and my dad called the police. I was too young then, so my parents didn't tell me the guy was actually known by the police as a sex offender.
I need to give you a little background on the situation my sister and I were in before I begin the story. I was having a hard time after September 11th of 2001. I had lost my job and got behind on a few bills, and I ended up sharing a small apartment with my sister who was also having a hard time catching up. We were feeling down and out in life, doing drugs and other things that we really shouldn't have been doing. We were definitely going down the wrong path. It was Halloween night 2003, all the trick-or-treaters had gone in for the evening. My sister and I realized that we didn't have anything in the house to drink, so we decided to go down to the corner store. We got our coats on and headed down the street, discussing where our lives were headed and how we needed to change the way we were living. Before we knew it, we were at the store. We went in and got our drinks and headed back home. On our way back home, we continued our conversation. We walked about two blocks and the both of us got a really eerie feeling. I looked up and saw a large being coming towards us. It was about six and a half feet tall. It was wearing a large top hat. It also had on a long black trench coat like the one that Jack the Ripper wore. We were a little bit creeped out but we decided to keep walking, a little more cautious in our strides. As we got closer to the being, more and more detail came into focus. It had long, white, wiry hair. Its arms and legs were out of proportion with the rest of its body. I then looked at its hands and realized that they too were extra long and thin, its fingers long and bony. It seemed to radiate pure evil. There was no way I could see its face or features that it had due to the top hat shading its face in the night. My sister and I were now really freaked out. There was no way we could get to the gate of our complex before it reached us. Its pace seemed to quicken as we got closer and closer to it. It almost seemed to glide across the ground in an unearthly gate. My sister grabbed my shoulder and pulled me through a gap in the fence. Safely on the other side of the fence, we glanced back. A few moments later, the being was there. It passed us with almost no acknowledgement except a slight movement of its head, as if to show its discontent in our escape. My sister and I, although shaken, headed home with an eager pace. The next morning I awoke with the events of the night before vividly in my mind. The more I thought about it, I realized that I didn't remember there ever being a gap in the fence before. I had walked all around the complex and the only openings in the fence were the entrance gates. I just thought that maybe the apartments had been doing maintenance on the fence, so I went to check. There weren't any gaps large enough for an adult to squeeze through, so I went to the office to ask them. They looked at me as if I were crazy and told me they hadn't done any maintenance on the fence in at least six months. I just thank God for giving us an out, and not allowing this thing to overtake my sister and I. Shortly after the events of that Halloween night, we quit doing drugs and we turned our lives around. I truly think the events of that night was a wake-up call for us. It was a divine way of telling us that we were going down the wrong path. I experienced the most terrifying thing last summer. It still resonates with me to this day. It happened at the drive-in movie theater with my school acquaintance. Her name was Anna. The reason I say school acquaintance is because Anna and I weren't necessarily friends, just two school colleagues going to see a movie. I have declined her invitation to go to this drive-in movie theater multiple times, as I wasn't interested in going. I decided to go this time as I felt sympathy for the loss of her dog. Her dog's name was Toby, and he had passed away a couple months ago. Anna has been depressed ever since. She tells me she visits the drive-in movie theater to cope with her loss, so I decide to go with her this time. Later that day, we arrive at the drive-in movie theater. Anna was the one that actually picked me up, so her car was what we were going to use to watch the movie in. There was a new slasher film out, so we were pretty excited about that. The drive-in movie theater had about 100 cars in the parking lot. As the movie began... Anna tells me she needed to use the porta potty and would be back in a couple of minutes. 
so I said okay. About 20 minutes later, I realized that Anna hadn't come back to the car yet. I was a bit annoyed due to the fact that she had missed a good portion of the movie. I was also a bit concerned, so I decided to go look for her. As I get out of the car, I can see Anna standing at a nearby lake. It looked like she was gazing out into the distance. I decided to approach her to see if she was okay. As I got closer to Anna, I could hear her talking with someone. I didn't see her holding a cell phone or any other electronics, so I found the ordeal quite strange. I hid behind a tree close to where Anna was. She kept repeating the same phrase. You will always be with me, Toby. Toby was the name of her dead dog. She just kept latching on to that one phrase over and over again. I took a peek from behind the tree, and I see the most disturbing thing ever. I see Anna talking to her dead dog, nailed on a tree. I freaked out and I went back inside the car. About five minutes later, Anna finally returned to the car. She apologized for taking so long and I tell her no worries. Throughout the rest of the movie, I pretended like nothing ever happened. I honestly couldn't even focus on the movie anymore. After the movie was done, Anna dropped me off at my apartment. I immediately block her from my phone and all my social media. I even went as far as to change schools the day after. I will never forget what I saw that night, as I feel it has scarred me for life. This happened to my husband back in 2007 on Halloween night. My husband called me to tell me as soon as this happened, and it's been boggling his mind ever since. He works for the railroad, and one night while on the train going south, he and his engineer passed through a small county, something he's done for five years, when something caught their attention. Up ahead, my husband saw someone lying on the tracks, and he told the engineer to slam on the brakes. The engineer saw the guy too, so he pulled the emergency brakes. But of course it takes about a mile for a train going 70 miles per hour to slow down. What they both saw was an older man with a beard, who was lying on his side facing the train. When the man saw the train as it got close, he put up both his hands in a defensive manner, and he had a frightened look on his face. Before they knew it, they slammed into the guy, and the train finally stopped. My husband and the engineer were shaken up, and my husband called his manager to tell him what had happened. He told them to call the local authorities and state troopers and so on. After everyone had showed up and they finally looked under the train, there was nothing. Nothing at all. My husband and the engineer were embarrassed because everyone was there to investigate, and there was nothing under the train. They swore that they had ran over the guy because they heard the thumping sounds as the train kept going. They walked back to the point of impact, and there was nothing. No blood, no clothes, no shoes. They called in the canines, but they couldn't pick up a scent. If they had hit someone and he ran off, there would have been blood or something, and I'm sure he wouldn't have gone very far. The local cops had told my husband and the engineer that there were a bunch of kids throwing mannequins off this bridge, so it was most likely just a mannequin. But that was impossible because of what they saw. So who knows what happened that night. My husband isn't much of a believer, and he isn't frightened by anything like this, or ghost stories for that matter. But it does make me wonder. So my dad runs a tree removal business out of our backyard, and has been since I was a baby. When I was five, we moved to a house with almost five acres of property, so he could park his work trucks, use wood chippers, and split and pile firewood comfortably. As a child, my brother and I loved playing near that. So my house is a little ways down a long driveway, and the driveway continues a bit, and then there's a garage with a little apartment attached. At this time, a couple of my parents were friends with rented this apartment, and this was about 50 yards away from the house. Fast forward to when I was 10 years old. My brother was 13 at the time. 
Also something to note, my dad's employees aren't exactly admirable people. Ex-addicts, thieves. I don't even know truthfully, but workers came and went. It's obviously not the best job, to work in the hot summer months and then have no work during the winter. Anyway, my dad hired these two brothers who were in their early 20s. One of them, I remember, was very good-looking, and his brother seemed dorky to me and wore glasses. Ten-year-old me didn't pay much attention, obviously. All I wanted to do was climb the wood piles in my backyard. One fall day after school, I remember my mom saying it was too chilly to play outside and to stay inside. I remember this so vividly. I literally remember what I was wearing and how I wanted my favorite stuffed animal near me as I colored. So I'm coloring. It's probably around 4.30, and my dad and his workers have just gotten back and are in the garage, maybe smoking weed or having a beer together. Apparently a normal routine after a long day. My mom was reading or something right by me. My brother was a few houses down the street with his friend and his family whom we've grown close with. All of a sudden, my dad comes running through the back door and he's yelling, Get out of the house. To grab me and get out now. Run to the neighbor's house now. Scared and confused, my mom jumps up, as I do, and I'm grateful my stuffed animal is close by, so I grab that, and we run out the front door to the neighbor's. It was chilly and my mom and I are barefoot. We fly up our long driveway, and my dad, who I thought was behind us, stalls at the end of our driveway on the phone, yelling to someone. We get to the neighbor's where my brother is, and we see the cops speed by to our house. We are all so confused. As it turned out, those brothers my dad hired were hiding something. The dorky one with the glasses was very mentally ill, and he was off his meds. Him, his brother, and his family were too embarrassed to mention that, and apparently smoking weed and drinking alcohol was a trigger. That evening, when the employees smoked weed and had a beer after that job, they failed to notice that the guy went to his car to grab a rifle and started shooting all over the place, especially at the wood piles which I would have been playing on normally, and into the garage with my dad's employees. He also shot at the cars, and left bullet holes in many of the workers and tenants' cars. The workers ran into the attached apartment to the garage with the couple living there. During this, my dad ran as fast as he could to the house to save my mom and me. So my dad's badass friend, who lived in the apartment, grabbed his hunting rifle and ran down to the garage area, while the employees hid in his shower. He saw the shooter jump in his car with his guns, and was about to speed off. My dad's friend took his own rifle, broke the shooter's car window, and grabbed the gun out of his hands. But the shooter took off down our long driveway. Gotta say, I'm glad my mom and I weren't running on the driveway when he was speeding out at full speed. The cops caught him very quickly just down the street, opposite end of the street where he hid. He was arrested and my parents didn't press charges since no one was hurt. They were more upset that all this could have been avoided had someone mentioned that he was mentally ill. My dad doesn't run background checks, just will pay whoever is willing and need a cash. Shady, I'm well aware. Also, something I literally just learned tonight. The day prior to the shooting, my brother had a weird encounter with the shooter. He was at a gas station with our neighbor, a friend of his and the same family's house we hid in the next day. My dad's worker pulls up and offers them a ride literally a three-minute car ride, and they agree because they know and recognize him. They note that he is strangely wearing black nail polish, and his hood is up, which wasn't normal of him. They thought nothing of it. We think now it maybe had something to do with him being off his meds, or just a coincidence. Who knows? I'm 25 now, and remember the experience vividly. I hope I never hear my dad's voice with that tone ever again. It was so scary. I still do not know how I didn't hear the gunshots, though. My mom believed because we live very close to a gun range, we have grown accustomed to that sound nearby. So, my dad's ex-employee, who shot multiple times at my home, let's not meet ever again, please. I moved to Denver about three years ago, in the fall of 1996. Anyway, the ghost in my house started to manifest itself in the winter of 1996. I woke up in my bedroom, which is now the guest bedroom by the way, because I refuse to sleep in it anymore, at about 1am, 
and glanced over at my bedside. There was a black Persian-looking cat there, with its paws propped up against the bedside so that it was standing on its hind paws. I'll never forget the sight for as long as I live. Its body was only semi-solid, but it had completely solid yellow eyes. It was staring at me fixedly. I don't think that it was just a trick of light, because of three reasons. One, those eyes. Two, it moved slightly, closing its eyes and shaking its head in a very cat-like fashion. Three, I moved my head to look at it better, and it stayed the same. I started to scream and my father came into the room after about five seconds of this. I looked up for a second when he came in. I looked back down, and it was gone. Me and my father conducted a very thorough search of the house, and turned up no evidence of a cat either being there or getting in. After that, odd things started to happen. Only when I was there, as if it was selective, things that have happened. My cat's dish was mysteriously moved from the floor to the kitchen sink when no one was home. A gray scarf-like object quickly flashed in a deserted room. A white skirt-like movement accompanied by rustling, resembling a wide skirt. I heard footsteps in my parents' bedroom, slowly walking around their bed. My cat sometimes stares at a point in my bedroom late at night when no one is there, using a look I know when she is watching a threat. One night when I was in bed, I felt a hand quite distinctly on my head. I saw a white figure in the corner in a deserted room, slinking gray cat shape out of the corner of my eye when I was at the computer. Things will disappear, and then when I check back in a place I've checked before, they are there. One night I heard something resembling footsteps walking slowly down the bedroom hallway, starting at the haunted bedroom and stopping at my door for several minutes before moving on. Thankfully, it has a happy ending. A few months ago, I was sitting at the computer reading a story I had picked off the internet. It was about ten at night and everyone else was asleep. Anyway, I felt a cold presence and was really freaked out. But this time, I felt like a prisoner in my own house whenever I was alone. Fear turned into anger. I got really mad and told the ghost to get out now and to never come back. Nothing actually happened that night, but after a moment of dead silence, my anger and courage left me and I ran upstairs to bed. I took my cat with me to bed. I fell asleep with the radio and lights on and the door shut. I had the most terrible time getting to sleep that night because I kept feeling presences. But whenever I felt anything, I would just tell it to go away. The most horrifying episode was when my cat actually stared at a corner of my bed and I had the most horrible feeling of something crouching there waiting to pounce. For about a week, the ghost seemed to gain strength. More things happened in that week than any other time. Then he just left. The last time I saw him was at about six in the morning. I had gotten up early to make myself some hot cocoa and was sitting at the kitchen table sipping a mug. To explain, my kitchen has two entrances one to the bedroom hall on one side of the room, and the other is to the dining room and living room. The living room connects the two so you can walk from one door to the other through the kitchen without being seen from the kitchen. However, this takes a good five seconds. Anyway, so I'm just sitting there. I watch the door to the bedroom hall for no particular reason, and see a gray cat shape leap out really quickly and then leap out of sight. I smiled, thinking it was only my own grayish cat. But not even one second later, my own cat prances in through the other doorway. There was no possible way for him to get from one end to the other. I can only conclude that he was saying goodbye. Something else I think is related. When I am going up this one stairwell in my house, I feel this horrible heart-stopping sensation of fear. It feels as if someone is behind me. I don't know who. It's almost as if they want to kill me and I have to get away. The danger feeling seems to emanate from a door at the base of the stairs leading outside into the garage. Sometimes when I run up the stairs from the fear, the feeling pursues you until about three feet away from the head of the stairs, where it stops immediately after a final burst.
The fear is absolutely blinding, as if you are running for your life. I've asked other people in my house about that, and they've all noticed nothing. And another one. Except in the hottest part of summer, when it is almost but not quite the same temperature as the rest of the house. The room I saw the cat spirit in is deathly cold. There's no explanation because it has the same amount of heating as the rest of the house. There are three thermostats in the house. One for the bedrooms, one for the living areas, and one for downstairs. Anyway, the living areas are always kept warmer in the house than the downstairs. Then the bedrooms are the coolest. But this room is frigid. Another not entirely explained phenomena was once about October of 1998 when I was trying to douse with a pendulum. I had it set to search for yellow, gold, or females. But once when I held it over a red object, it started to circle for no reason at all. It was completely reliable for everything else. I don't know the story of the house, but the most recent house owners were a young couple who remodeled it completely. Then there was an FBI agent, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was an elderly couple who lived in the house since it was built in the 1950s, until they both died of old age. I'm keeping a journal now on my computer of strange happenings. Anyway, the ghost is out. I will also be moving out sometime this summer. Everyone else in my family loves the house and never wants to move out, but I hate this house and can't wait to move. I still feel like the ghost is there waiting for me. I wonder about the next owners of the house and what they will go through. This happened to me a couple months ago. I was home alone on a Friday night. My parents were out of town and I had the house to myself. This would be the perfect opportunity to invite a girl over, but I unfortunately didn't have one. At least not anymore, as I recently just broke up with my girlfriend Katie. I decided to watch some Netflix since I was by myself that night. While watching Netflix, I casually went on Snapchat and scrolled through my friend's stories. I always avoided opening Katie's story ever since we broke up, just because I wanted to show her that I had moved on. As I was skimming through the stories, I accidentally played Katie's story. It was a snap of her crying. It looked like she was in some kind of an abandoned setting. I was quite disturbed to say the least, but I assumed she was crying because she wasn't taking the breakup easily. I decided to snap Katie. As I contemplate on what to say, I get a Snapchat notification. It was Katie. She had sent a Snapchat video. I assumed she had snapped me because she had seen that I had watched her story. I got kind of nervous, but I opened the snap anyway. The snap showed Katie getting her face smothered by someone, while another person was snapping her. You could see a third person hold a 9mm pistol towards her head while Katie was gasping for air. The snap eventually cut off, and I immediately snapped Katie back, saying, Where the hell are you? Whoever was using her phone immediately opened the snap. About five seconds later, they snapped me back, but this time it was a message. I opened the message and it read, Check my story now. I go to Katie's story and I immediately open it. What I saw left me trembling in fear. The story showed Katie's mouth forcibly opened by a mouth opener. You could see someone drop a live spider inside her mouth, and then the snap abruptly ends. I immediately send a message saying, Leave her alone, or I will call the cops. The person using the phone opened the message and left it on red. I end up calling the cops and I wait for them to show up at my house. As I wait for them to arrive, I check my Snapchat to see if Katie's abductors posted any new stories. There was nothing. As a matter of fact, her account was no longer visible. I assume whoever was on Katie's phone deleted the post and the account. About five minutes later, the cops arrive at my door. They launched a search party and that was the end of the night. To this day, my ex-girlfriend Katie is still missing. I sometimes drive to our old dating spots 
in hopes that she will miraculously show up. And every time I hear a Snapchat notification now, I always think it's Katie. This story takes place in Warsaw, Indiana, December of 2011. My fiancé and I went there to visit his family for Christmas, and we stayed at a hotel called Ramada, now renamed as the Wyndham, for about a week. Our hotel room was situated on the first floor next to an exit door on the left side of the building. Our room was a standard hotel room. When you walked in, the bathroom was immediately on your left, and the bed was next to the bathroom, also on the left-hand side. On Christmas Eve morning, at approximately 4 a.m., I awoke terrified. I had no idea why I was so scared. I did not remember having a bad dream. I then heard what sounded like footsteps around the right side of the bed and bathroom. I thought I was hearing things from outside our room, but the sounds were clearly coming from our room and by our bed. I listened for a few more seconds to make sure I was awake and not still dreaming and I kept hearing the footsteps. I was extremely terrified. I looked over at my fiancé and he was in a deep sleep, breathing slowly. I then sat up in the bed. I felt the sensation of the bed lifting up underneath my legs and falling down. It was very weird. I then woke up my fiancé in a panic and told him I thought something was in our room. I got up and looked under the bed, looked in the bathroom, looked outside of our room, and there was nothing. I even looked for holes that mice could come through to get into our room. There was no way to explain the constant footsteps around the bed that I was hearing. My fiancé went back to bed, while I stayed up for the rest of the morning up until we got ready for breakfast with his family. We came back to the hotel after breakfast to rest for a little bit. My fiancé said he was going to go to the gym for a quick ten-minute run. I told him I was going to close my eyes for a little bit. I remember that once I laid down in the bed and closed my eyes, I felt the sensation of my head being pulled back. I opened my eyes, and the feeling stopped. I closed my eyes, and once again, I had the same feeling. I opened my eyes once more, but I could only get them to open halfway, and I could not move my body. I tried to yell for help, but nothing came out of my mouth except mumbling. This only lasted for a few seconds, but I was terrified. I thought maybe I had sleep paralysis, which I had experienced before upon waking up after a night of sleep. Of course, my fiancé came back in from his run, the moment I sat up in bed after my sleep paralysis. I told him what had happened, and he immediately went to the front desk to change rooms. He was that worried. He just told the front desk that I heard noises and I wanted to change rooms. The girl at the front desk just appeared indifferent and just said, Oh. The hotel let us move to the room next door. That night while I was trying to fall asleep, I heard a noise that sounded like someone rolling a marble across the wooden TV stand directly in front of the bed. The next few nights in that room, I didn't hear or experience anything strange. I didn't bother asking the front desk about the first room we stayed in when we left. I didn't want to look weird. I googled the hotel in the area, but I couldn't find anything paranormal about it. I don't know if this qualifies as a ghostly experience or not, but it was very strange. This happened to me on Valentine's Day. It was a Thursday night and I decided to go to a nightclub downtown. I usually go clubbing with friends, but I was tired of third wheeling all the time since most of my friends had girlfriends. This club was pretty wild. It was my first time going to this particular nightclub. I was told that it was easy to hook up with females here. At least that's what my friends said. It was Valentine's Day, so I assumed that most girls were looking to hook up. I remember getting a beer at the bar. That one beer I got turned into ten beers. I honestly lost track of how much I drank, but all I know is that I was pretty intoxicated. I noticed a girl looking at me from the other side of the bar. She was pretty attractive from what I remember. She was brunette, voluptuous, and she had a nice smile. I noticed she kept smiling at me, which gave me the impression she wanted to talk, 
so I did. I approached her and I introduced myself. She introduced herself as well, and we ended up dancing together on the dance floor. A couple minutes later, I started zoning out, and I remember being inside a cab with the girl. She told me that we were on the way to her place. I felt like every time I closed my eyes, I would end up somewhere else. That's how drunk I was. The girl goes to the washroom while I waited in the living room. I remember seeing a bunch of portraits of sleeping men on the wall. There were about five of them. I found it kind of strange to say the least, but I was too drunk to care about it. I then FaceTimed my friend Eric and I bragged to him about how I was able to score a hot chick. I put my phone away as I see the girl come out of the washroom. She sits next to me and asks if I want to be her husband. I assumed she was joking, so I jokingly say, sure. What she said next creeped me out. She said, you better marry me, or else. I assumed she was drunk talking, so I asked her how much she had to drink. She then said, a lot, of water, and gave me this blank stare. I guess she was implying that she was sober. I'm not sure if she was being sarcastic, but it made me feel uncomfortable, knowing that she was sober. She then said, If you don't marry me, I will kill you like the rest of them. Right after she said that, she points at the portraits of the sleeping men on the wall. I was confused, but then I started putting two and two together. The portraits weren't of sleeping men. They were portraits of men she killed for not marrying her. I immediately ran to the nearest room and I locked myself inside it. The girl started saying things like, Happy Valentine's Day, baby, and then began stabbing a knife through the door repeatedly. I was getting disoriented and I eventually blacked out. The next day, I miraculously wake up in a hospital. I ask a nearby doctor what happened. He told me that I was held captive by a serial killer. The girl I had met at the club happened to be wanted by the police department for multiple counts of murder. She ended up taking her own life when she heard the cops outside her door. My friend Eric saved my life that night. I apparently left my phone on FaceTime when I was on the phone with him. He heard everything that was going on and he called the cops. The cops were able to track my location through my phone's GPS thanks to my friend Eric. As I tell you all this story, be careful who you meet on Valentine's Day, as it could very well be your last day. I think a ghost is attacking me, or I'm going crazy. The first incident happened about two years ago around seven in the morning. Someone who I thought was my dad came into my room to wake me up so that I could open the gate, and he told me to watch over the house while he was gone. Well, my dad wears a black sweater and black sweatpants to bed, so I didn't look at the face. I was so tired and mad that I had to get up at that time. When I got up to open the gate, I found my dad sleeping in his bed. That really ticked me off, so I woke him up to find out that he had never come into my room. My sister had a similar experience, but it took the form of my stepmom. It told her to get ready for school at 2 o'clock in the morning, so she got up and took a shower. Last year, on October 31st at around 2 a.m., I woke up, and when I closed my eyes to go back to sleep, I could feel someone in my bed. I tried to open my eyes, but I was paralyzed. This happened every night for about two months. In the past few weeks, it's been starting up again and it's getting stronger. Like one night I woke up at 2.12 a.m. and I was awake for about 20 minutes. I was watching the clock and when I closed my eyes, I started hearing loud whispering that sounded like a leaky sink. And before I could open my eyes, it was on me and I tried to scream with all my might, but I only got some weird noises out. My sister heard them, but didn't think anything of it. Now when it gets on me, 
I'm not even sure if it's on me anymore. I don't feel it holding me down. I relax my muscles and still, I can't open my eyes. I've managed to open them a few times, but I don't see anything. When I'm finally able to move, I stay awake. But sometimes, it comes back on me, or does whatever it seems to do. This happened to me about a year ago. I live in Tokyo, Japan, and live home alone. My mom used to live with me until she died from a seizure. To be honest, I found her death quite odd as she did not have any past health-related issues. We had a caregiver that used to live with us too. She was very polite to us and used to take care of my mom when I was at work. We both started noticing my mom becoming more ill leading up to her death, but unfortunately we couldn't do anything to help. I'll always remember the date, November 26th, the day I found my mom dead in her room. Let's just say her funeral was one of the hardest things I've had to go through. One night I was in Shinjuku, basking in the view. Shinjuku is a special ward in Tokyo, the place with the bright neon signs and lights for those of you who don't know. I remember seeing someone staring at me from afar. The person looked like a teenage girl. She was really pale from what I was able to see. She also had a white gown on and she was barefoot. What kind of person comes out in public barefoot? I was a bit creeped out to say the least, but I paid no attention to it. I decided to head back home and ignore whoever that person was. As I approached my street, I noticed someone looking at me from behind a nearby mailbox. I could see a protruding head glaring just above the mailbox. I squinted my eyes, only to see the same creepy girl I saw in Shinjuku. I felt sick to my stomach, as I knew she must have followed me home. The creepy girl then ducked her head from view. I approached the mailbox and I looked behind it. She was gone. I figured she must have went inside the mailbox. I opened the mail slot only to see nothing. At this point, I genuinely felt like I was hallucinating, so I decided to just call it a day and I headed home. The next morning, I head out of my house to go to work, only to hear my name being called by a female. The sounds were coming from the same mailbox I supposedly saw that girl. I approached the mailbox. What I saw next left me trembling in fear. It was the same girl. Her pale arm reached out of the mail slot holding an envelope. She then said, Take it. I was petrified, but I ended up taking the envelope. I went back home and slammed my door shut. I was confused as to how the hell she knew my name. I opened the envelope, and I saw a disc inside of it. I decided to put the disc in my laptop, only to see a glitchy video playing. I can see my mom and our caregiver. The video said it took place on January the 13th, 2018. The video showed our caregiver putting something inside a bowl of soup. It then showed my mom eating the soup right after. I can see the caregiver watching my mom from behind and doing a cutthroat motion. I was freaking out, but I continued watching. The video then cut to November 26th. November 26th was the day my mom died. It showed my mom laying on the floor while the caregiver stood there watching her. She had a sinister look on her face. The video then cuts to later that day. It showed myself crying while the caregiver had a look of sorrow. I knew it was all fake. The video then cut to a year prior to all this. It showed the caregiver again. You could see her doing the exact same thing with another bowl of soup. She was putting some sort of lethal toxin inside of it. It then showed a girl eating the soup. The girl looked quite familiar. I then realized it was the same girl I saw in Shinjuku. I was terrified out of my mind, but at the same time, I was relieved to have closure. I now know how my mom died.
I plan on using this footage as evidence to prosecute the caregiver. The only thing is, how do I explain the girl in the video?